This channel is part of the History Hits Network. England's glorious history has been steeped in ambition, greed, treachery, and betrayal. Its castle walls have witnessed centuries of bloodshed. The anguished wails of the forlorn still echo through the corridors. Cut off by tragic death, these restless spirits have been trapped in limbo between heaven and hell. Manifestations of the paranormal have many names in Britain. Wraiths, spunkies, chagrins, church grims, hags of the dribble. From the ancient druids to Dickens' A Christmas Carol, spirits have been a palpable presence in the English landscape. On the west coast of England's remote Cumbrian region stands Muncaster Castle, where two bloody murders triggered a series of strange events that cannot be explained. This rugged and beautiful landscape has echoed to the gruesome cries of the inhabitants of Muncaster Castle. For today, the castle is plagued by eerie hauntings, odd happenings, and disturbing manifestations. The present owner of the castle is Patrick Gordon Duff Pennington. Sometimes when I open the doors and open the shutters in the mornings, people pull the doors out of my hand. The last curator, he used to see a grey lady walking up and down the red passage outside our room. The tapestry room, people have slept in there and have asked to be moved. They hear people cry when they feel cold. They think it's a nasty place to be in. And, People who feel anything at all, they come out not quite the same as they went in. Residents and guests of the castle also report the distinct sound of thumping on the stairs. Evidence of paranormal occurrences was so strong at Muncaster Castle that the family called in a team of specialists to investigate. On September the 18th, 1993, the experts set up an array of monitoring equipment for a scientific study of the hauntings. They waited for nightfall. At 10.40 p.m., the investigators felt the temperature drop dramatically. A minute later, a vase began shaking. Then a loud thud was heard, followed by three raps. The investigators noticed a movement past the door. The team observed so many unexplained events that they reported it is hard to come to any conclusion other than that Muncaster Castle is inhabited by supernatural energies. Not a few of the supernatural happenings have been attributed to a malevolent spirit that inhabits the castle. And in Muncaster's long story, there's no more malevolent character to judge by events than Thomas Skelton. Malicious, vicious, witty, and cruel. No one could play a trick more thoroughly than Tom Skelton. 
He loved to sit under a chestnut tree near the castle and wait for passers-by seeking directions. Those he didn't like, he'd send to their deaths in the quicksands below. In 1585, a scandal broke around the daughter of the castle lord. Hellwise Pennington earned her name as a fiery, passionate and fatally headstrong young lady. Although betrothed to the son of a powerful neighbouring family, Hellwise fell in love with the village carpenter. but their encounters were not to remain secret. When word reached Hellwise's father, Sir William, he sought out Tom Skelton, meeting him here under what became known as Thomas's tree. He told him to put an end to the scandalous affair. Skelton summoned the carpenter to the castle under the pretense that he was to meet his beloved Hellwise. Once there, he plied the carpenter with cider until he was drunk and insensible. Then Skelton used the carpenter's own tools, a mallet and broad chisel, to hack off the young man's head. He was heard to say, when the lazy dolt wakes up, he'll have trouble finding his head. Always one to please his master, Skelton presented Hellwise's father with the young carpenter's head. History does not record Sir William's reaction. I thought it was rather silly, the story, but then, when we'd been here a little while, we used to work terribly hard, started in the office at six in the morning, and after tea, I would walk across the hall sometimes, and there were footsteps used to follow me. You don't think it could possibly have been an echo? No, I tried that out. No, it wasn't. And I, I've tried it with sort of a shoes that didn't make a noise, but I've always heard the... behind me. The thumping heard in the hallways could well be the sound of Skelton dragging the young carpenter's body through the castle. <laughs> and the mournful crying? Could it be Hellwise weeping over her murdered lover? <laughs> Afterwards, the heartbroken Hellwise disappeared into a nunnery and eventually went mad. As for Thomas Skelton, he never paid for his crime, but fate has a way of meeting out justice. He drowned in the River Esk. Is Manchester still haunted by the presence of Tom Fool, waiting to play one last trick? Two 
200 years later, these dark waters were to claim more lives and give rise to another apparition. One that prefers this road leading to Munkister Castle. Grace Simmons, an employee of the castle, has seen the ghost. It would be about October in 1985 that uh, I'd been out for a night and coming back up the road, driving up the road with my husband, and just come around the corner. And I saw this lady standing. She was leaning against the wall. And she seemed in distress, so I said to my husband, would you stop? And I'll get out of the car and go back and make sure she's all right. And yeah, I went back. When I got back to the corner, she'd gone. The woman in white began appearing after a gruesome murder in 1822. Love seems to be ill-fated at Munkister Castle. Mary Bragg, a servant in a nearby village, was madly in love with the castle's steward. But the housekeeper, a Miss Little Dell, had taken a fancy to the same man. One night, her jealousy turned to rage. Two ruffians appeared at Mary's door. Concocting a lie, they claimed her beloved had fallen ill and she must rush to him. Alarmed, Mary went with the two men. She never made it to her lover's side. <laughs> Near a tree on the road through Munkester Wood, the abductors pulled Mary Bragg from the carriage. A pistol was rammed into her mouth. But poor Mary's body had more indignities to suffer. To get rid of it, the murderers left it in a field for the castle dogs to devour. When that failed, they tried to find a hiding place. They hoped the waters of the River Esk would do their dirty work. But Mary Bragg's body refused to stay hidden. Months later, it was found washed up, further down river, badly decomposed. At the coroner's inquest, a doctor claimed it was impossible to determine the cause of death. Some say he'd been bribed to cover up the murder. But those involved with Mary Bragg's murder did not escape their fates. They met with bizarre ends. One of her assassins went insane, another was hanged as a highway robber. Mary's rival, Miss Littledell, who had hired the killers, became the subject of rumor and suspicion. Eventually, she was banished to a remote village where she was shunned as a murderess. The doctor at the inquest drowned in the river Esk, not a hundred yards from where Mary's body had been dumped. In 1993, the tree under which Mary Bragg died was cut down. The timber was reputed to be cursed. Blood began to ooze from the cut logs. No one locally would have anything to do with the wood. It had to be shipped to London to be sold.
The apparition of the woman in a long white dress was seen on the very spot where the tree stood. Brutally murdered and mistreated in death, could it be that Mary Bragg still wanders in search of justice? No unearthly presence is more powerful than one that haunts Sewdley Castle in the southwest of England. Nestled amongst the rolling hills of Gloucestershire, Sewdley sits in an ancient wooded valley that has changed little since it was established in Saxon times. Today, the grounds are known for their majestic oaks and deer-filled royal parklands. Sewdley Castle began as an extravagant royal wedding present in the 10th century. It went on to be owned by a succession of kings, including Richard III and Henry VIII. Despite its pastoral beauty, Sewdley Castle has a history of otherworldly events including the chilling discovery of the strangely preserved corpse of a queen. Some say these incidents can be traced back to a tragic event that resulted in an apparition which still haunts Sewdley Castle to this day. Employees report strange sights and sounds in the castle. The smell of an apple-scented perfume, the frequent forlorn sobs of a child, and the appearance of a tall, beautiful woman in a long green dress. Catherine Parr was a striking figure. Nearly six feet tall, with auburn hair, she was intelligent and artistic, a lover of music and poetry. She is famous for being Henry VIII's sixth and last wife. Catherine Parr managed to keep her head and outlive him. Catherine always had a passion for this man, Thomas Seymour. He was handsome, selfish, a buccaneer, a political adventurer. He was determined to be near the crown. After Henry VIII died in 1547, Seymour proposed to his daughter, Princess Elizabeth. When she refused, he turned to the king's widow, Catherine. They were married later the same year and came to live here at Sewdley. Within months, Catherine was pregnant. At the age of 35, it must have seemed a miracle, and everyone in the castle prepared for the birth with excitement and celebration. Sewdley's great banquet hall echoed with parties, music, dancing, and laughter. Then tragedy struck. Gloom silenced the castle. Catherine gave birth to a baby girl named Mary, but a week later, Catherine died from a fever. Mother and infant daughter were forever separated. But the tragedy did not end there. With Catherine barely dead, Thomas Seymour abandoned his newborn daughter and headed for London. Thomas Seymour went straight to Princess Elizabeth's bedroom and proposed to her for the second time. And the 15-year-old had the good sense to turn him down again. Undeterred, off he went and asked her half-sister Mary. She too turned him down. Thomas Seymour's lust for power in the end was to prove his undoing. Indeed, he was beheaded for treason. When he died, Princess Elizabeth wrote, this day died a man of much wit and very little judgment. Catherine was buried in the chapel at Sewdley in 1550. During civil war, a century later, the chapel was ransacked. Her casket disappeared. 140 years later, a local farmer digging in the grounds came across a casket sealed in lead. He forced it open, and what he saw astonished him. 
the body of a woman, perfectly preserved, her complexion still milky white, her hair auburn. But within seconds, the corpse started to wither and turn to dust, and the terrified man hastily reburied the casket. It wasn't until a century later when this new chapel was built. Catherine Parr was finally entombed in a manner befitting a Queen of England. Apparently, Catherine Parr's spirit was not to rest. Margaret Parker, who's worked here at the castle for 23 years, is the latest witness to the Queen's return. It must be about nine years ago. In the middle of winter, the castle was all locked up. And it was just five girls and myself cleaning. And it was an artist upstairs in Catherine Parr's room painting. Knowing the woman artist was about, Margaret Parker wasn't surprised when she saw a figure standing in the window. Good morning. But the artist had only just come down from the nursery. Did she frighten you? No. Well, I don't think the dead can hurt you, can it? Unlike some ghosts, the former queen is a melancholy spirit who keeps to herself. But for those who live and work here, she's become a friend. No, no, Katie. After Catherine's death, her daughter Mary mysteriously disappeared from history. No one knows what became of the unfortunate little orphan. Four centuries later, are these two tragic souls seeking reunion? As if to purge itself of sorrow, Sudley lay in ruins for 180 years. Then in the 19th century, Sudley came alive again. Restored to its former glory, it was once again a home. But with a new generation of owners came a new occupant from the spirit world. During the Victorian era, people were fascinated by ghosts. They were everywhere. To glimpse a spirit was to be reunited with a loved one who had passed on. It seems only natural that a Victorian apparition is behind Sudley's latest haunting, a haunting that has been witnessed quite recently. Her name is Janet, and she was the housekeeper here for many, many years. She was here for 50 years. She came in 1896. My late husband, Mark, used to tell me stories about her when he came home from school, that she was still here, and everyone still terrified of her, and she was still ruling the roost with the iron glove. And so that's why I think she's still here. She just won't give it up. The upkeep of a grand Victorian household such as Sudley required armies of servants, housemaids, footmen and gardeners, all had their allotted place in the hierarchy. As housekeeper, Janet was in a superior position. Together with the butler, she was responsible for the strict running of the castle. 
ensuring that everything ran like clockwork and taking orders from the lady of the house. But her supervision didn't end there. In accordance with the rigid moral code of the day, she took particular interest in keeping the female workers chaste. Many of them were young, unsophisticated girls from South Wales who were away from home for the first time. Janet took it upon herself to safeguard their morals, sternly keeping amorous boys at bay. It was said that at night Janet stood watch at the top of the stairs, protecting the virtue of her housemaids. Even today, death has not loosened Janet's hold over her domain. Young girls who enter Sudley seem to attract the housekeeper's attention. As one teenager found out in the summer of 1993 when she was on a tour of the castle. At the heavily gilted gold frame, you will find a picture of... Suddenly, without warning, a strange feeling overcame the girl, urging her up the staircase. If Sudley's ghosts seem to linger out of duty or longing, that is not the case with our next castle. There, the letting of blood has spawned a legion of anguished spirits, for this is the Tower of London. For almost a 1,000 years, this revered landmark has been at the center of the grand drama that is English history. It is said, he who holds the tower holds the power. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the royal palace and fortress of Her Majesty's Tower of London, the largest and oldest permanently occupied fortress in Europe. It covers over 18 acres, it took 200 years to build. It comprises of 20 towers, not one. Probably the best known, although one of the smallest, is the bloody tower here behind you. As a royal residence, the tower was home to England's kings and their courts. It was also a fortress and arsenal bristling with weapons. The royal mint was located here, and to this day, the magnificent crown jewels are still kept under guard within the tower walls. Outside the small town called Hastings, he defeated the Saxon army. On the theory that one should keep one's friends close but hold one's enemies even closer, dangerous foes of the state were kept here as prisoners. Torture and violent death were an ever-present possibility for the people of England. Hundreds fell victim to the red-hot poker, the spikes of the Iron Maiden, and the executioner's axe. The tower was witness to bloody deeds, terrible torment, and unbearable suffering. And a very good day to you. Thank you very much. Thanks. As daylight is extinguished, visitors leave the tower. Gates fall shut. An uneasy silence descends over the tower walls. As the ancient stage for dramas of cruelty, ambition and revenge, the tower is said to be the most haunted castle in England. After trials for crimes, real or invented, prisoners were brought by boat to this entrance, the Traitor's Gate. Then under guard, the condemned were led into the tower grounds.
the ravens watched them pass. Legend has it that as long as the ravens stay, the tower will stand and England will remain unconquered. World War II, the Blitz. London is under siege from German planes. the River Thames is not far from the docks and factories in the east end of London, the target of the attack. In the midst of this chaos, a terrifying vision formed at one of the tower gates. It was the autumn of 1940. A soldier was standing guard. He was completely unprepared for what was about to happen. Out of the mist appeared four men. They were carrying a litter. As they neared, the soldier could see a figure under a bloodstained blanket. Then the procession vanished into thin air. The uniforms later described by the century were exactly what sheriff's officers would have worn in the 14th century. And the procession took the route always followed after executions when headless bodies were brought to this chapel to be buried. But the most persistent haunting is said to take place just over there, in the bloody tower. Two young boys have been glimpsed playing in the tower. They are believed to be the spirits of two princes, nine-year-old Richard and the heir to the throne, 12-year-old Edward, the victims of a shocking crime. The boys were nephews of Richard III, England's favorite villain. Richard's enemies described him as malicious, wrathful, envious, little of stature, crook-backed. Still a controversial figure 500 years after his death. Some blame Richard for a series of treacherous murders, while others passionately defend him. What is known is that after the death of their father, King Edward IV, the two young princes were put under Richard's protection. Some say it was like assigning the fox to guard the chickens. For the princes stood between Richard and the crown. Richard had his nephews declared illegitimate and thus ineligible for the throne. He then confined them to the tower for their own safety, he said. For months they were seen playing on the battlements and in their room. But suddenly, in the autumn of 1483, the two boys disappeared, never to be seen again. No one knows exactly what happened, but with his nephews out of the way, the last obstacle between Richard and the throne was removed, allowing him to be crowned King of England. Forty years later, Sir Thomas More, himself later executed at the Tower, described in a book what he believed to be the fate of the boys. He said Richard had dispatched two of his men to the Tower. As the boys slept, they stole into the room. Then they smothered the two sleeping princes. 
Moore wrote, they gave up their souls unto the joys of heaven, leaving to the tormentors their bodies dead in the bed. According to Moore, they were buried under a great heap of stone. In 1674, workmen uncovered a chest just near here. In it were the skeletons of two children. In 1933, these were scientifically examined. From the bone formation and the structure of the teeth, it was concluded they were the skeletons of two boys, a 12-year-old and a 9-year-old, matching the ages of the princes. As befitting a future king of England and his brother, the two small bodies were interred at Westminster Abbey. But their hapless spirits linger in the bloody tower. Betrayed, abandoned, murdered, they cling to each other in death as they did in life. The ghosts of the two little princes are reminders of the ruthless history of Britain's early monarchy. And the spirit that appears in this area of the tower is connected to another king's murderous determination. These rooms are the home of a particularly gruesome apparition. Anne Boleyn is the controversial figure in this story. Some champion her as a modern woman, vibrant, headstrong and intelligent. Her enemies saw her as an ambitious schemer with an arrogant, tempestuous spirit. Anne's boldness and independence enchanted King Henry VIII. The attraction would precipitate a major turning point in English history and a personal tragedy for Anne. The king was married to Catherine of Aragon but after 22 years, she failed to produce a male heir. For the young, flirtatious Anne Boleyn, it was easy to bewitch the king. He pined for her. He wrote her passionate love letters. Matters came to a head when she became pregnant. Expecting the son he so desperately wanted and needed to ensure the succession, the king convened parliament and had his marriage with Catherine annulled. And the divorce which followed caused the celebrated break with Rome and the beginning of Protestant England, of which Anne Boleyn finally became queen. But she gave birth to a girl, the future Queen Elizabeth I. A second child, a longed-for boy, was stillborn. Henry grew tired of waiting for Anne to produce a son. His passions were aroused by a young lady in waiting, Jane Seymour. Where Anne had been the other woman, she was now the aggrieved wife. Anne had become an obstacle to Henry's dynastic ambitions. She had many enemies in court. Rumours of witchcraft, adultery, treason, even trumped-up charges of incest with her brother gave Henry the opportunity he needed. Anne was arrested and taken to the tower. Tried and found guilty, she was sentenced to be executed. As she awaited death, Anne had violent mood swings. One moment she was laughing, the next crying. Then a calm overcame her. She sent a message to Henry requesting that her head be cut off with a sword, not an axe. The axe was messy and often took more than one stroke. The morning of May the 19th, 1536. A flock of scavenging ravens gathered to watch as Anne Boleyn was led into the courtyard of Tower Green. When the inevitable moment came, the executioner readied the sword behind her back. Anne looked forwards 
and before she knew what was happening, eyewitnesses reported the executioner smote off her head at a stroke. Immediately after the execution, the executioner picked up the head and displayed it to the crowd who had gathered to see the execution. And the story goes that the eyes continue to move and the lips continue to move for several seconds after the beheading. The body was then put into an arrow chest. Apparently there was no coffin available for some reason. Put into an arrow chest with the head tucked under her arm and she was then buried in the chapel of St Peter at Vincula, which was immediately behind the execution site. Within 24 hours of Anne's burial, King Henry married his new wife. But headstrong in life, Anne Boleyn's spirit was not to be denied by death. An apparition has been sighted near where Anne spent her last days. In 1864, a tired of London employee working there suddenly felt a cold mist around him. A woman's figure emerged. As the worker stood watching in wonder, the figure turned towards him but where a face should have been, there was nothing. Do you believe in ghosts? There are things which happen to people. They haven't happened to me, but they've happened to my wife, for example, and other people I know uh, in the tower, which are difficult to explain um, by any sort of normal physical explanation. A frail apparition dwells in a parallel universe, trapped between reality and the beyond. Are these restless souls condemned for eternity to walk this blood-stained earth, tormenting the human psyche? We've encountered some victims of England's long, harsh history. Perhaps we better leave this haunted tower before we too lose our heads. Have we persuaded you that the castle ghosts of England are real? I'm convinced that right now, somewhere, a ghost is preparing to make its nightly rounds, and another haunting will soon be underway. Scotland is a land that has witnessed a bloody history of intrigue and betrayal. The victims of cruel torture and untimely death have become restless spirits, doomed to linger in its haunted castles. Cursing the generations that follow, their suffering echoes down the years. But that is not unusual in Scotland. Scotland's past is as rich and dramatic as its landscape. Its great mountains and dark, secretive glens still echo with the battle cries of centuries ago.
As well as Scotland's warlike traditions, there exists a strong belief in the powers of the supernatural. It is said that some Scots have the gift of foretelling the future, known as second sight. Each clan had a seer who was given to premonitions. But this gift of prophecy is more often a curse, for death and disaster constitute the commonest visions. Hauntings and paranormal activities are often concentrated in particular places. A wood, a silent lake, a holy site or buildings where gruesome events have taken place. All over Scotland, relics of an ancient past confound modern man with their strange images and sounds. Scotland's turbulent history seeps into the present day and creates powerful apparitions. And Scottish castles, where much of that history has been played out, are where a great many of these hauntings have been experienced. Their very stones echo with the struggles they have witnessed. It is in these strongholds that the ghosts of the victims linger on. Scottish castles were the sites of many bloody battles fought to preserve independence against the English. But within Scotland's own borders, thousands were slaughtered as a result of violent feuds between different Scottish clans. A haunted fortress stands on the west coast of Scotland, in the region of Argyll. This is Duntroon Castle, dominating the rocky headland overlooking the Sound of Jura. Built more than 800 years ago to guard the surrounding countryside against raiders from across the sea, Duntroon is the oldest continuously inhabited castle in Scotland. Now a peaceful home, it was once the scene of bitter clan fighting. To this day, Duntroon is haunted by the heroic deed of a lone piper who paid for his clan loyalty with a gruesome death. Mysterious music is often heard. The piper's desperate tune carried on the wind across the misty waters. The sound of Scottish pipes has haunted the castle for many years, summoning memories of Duntroon's brutal past. Other paranormal events occur within the castle. Furniture moves of its own accord. Objects hurl themselves at walls. Clocks stop. And a gruesome discovery was unearthed beneath the castle flagstones. Four hundred years ago, our sitting room was the approach to the main castle entrance. So anybody coming or going had to go through that room. On certain nights, the Malcolm's dog behaved strangely, as if it had seen and heard something. I wish I could see what it is the dogs have seen or felt. Uh, I haven't yet, but I hope one day I shall. To understand the hauntings at Duntroon, we must return to its blood-stained past. Duntroon was owned by the powerful Campbell clan. 
During the 1600s, Scottish clans were fiercely individual, ferociously holding sway over their regions. At that time, as a result of a civil war raging across Britain, the Scots were divided. The Campbells fought on the side of Parliament, while others, like their enemies, the Macdonalds, supported the King, Charles I. Hearing that most of the Campbells were away from their castle at Duntroon, Colquito, a Macdonald chieftain, took advantage of the situation and attacked the castle. As soon as the Macdonalds had taken Duntroon, Carl Quito sailed away to continue his campaign. He left behind a small garrison and his loyal Piper to guard the castle. Pipers held an important place within the Scottish clans. Well educated and travelled, they ranked highly in the chief's household. When going into battle, the Piper stood forth alone, piping the men onward, their focus of loyalty. The Campbell clan were determined to regain their castle from the Macdonalds. In Colquito's absence, they mounted a counterattack. Eventually, the Campbell clan recaptured Duntroon. Every MacDonald was put to the sword, except one, the MacDonald Piper. As privileged individuals, Pipers were protected. Colquito's Piper was spared. Imprisoned in the castle and surrounded by enemies, the Piper knew that his master would return to Duntroon. At any time, Colquito's boat could appear across the waters, bringing him back and heralding the MacDonald clan's return to the castle and almost certain death. As day dawned, the Piper scanned the horizon for a glimpse of his master's boat, desperate to find a way of warning him. At last, the piper saw a shape on the horizon and made out the MacDonald galley. He did the only thing he could to warn his master. He began to play his pipes. Across the waters, Colquito heard the faint strains of the bagpipes. He thought he recognized a familiar tune and assumed it was a welcoming air from his piper. But as he sailed nearer, the notes suddenly changed. And he realized that this was instead an urgent warning saying to him, beware, turn back.
Kolkita turned his boat about, and the MacDonald sailed away to safety. But for the Piper, there was no escape. For the Campbells had realized the message in the tune. A punishment was found to fit the crime. They cut off his hands so he could play no more. The piper bled to death from his wounds. Those who dismissed the story as a romantic myth were suddenly confronted with gruesome evidence. In about 1880, a chilling discovery was made beneath these flagstones. Repairs were being carried out here and the stones were being replaced. Suddenly one of the workmen gasped in horror. Hey John, look at this. He called his workmate over. Oh. Staring up at them from its shallow grave was a human skull. When the surrounding slabs were lifted, a full skeleton was revealed. They saw quite clearly the skeleton had no hands. The workers in the castle lord stared in amazement. Surely the bones that lay before them were the mortal remains of the ghost that haunted the castle, the Piper of Duntroon. We commend into thy hands, most merciful father, the soul of this, our brother departed. The Lord of the Castle asked the Bishop to give the skeleton a proper burial and to exorcise the spirit that roamed Duntroon. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God. The Bishop performed the rite of bell, book, and candle. And the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. But despite the exorcism, the Piper's spirit still seems to dwell within the castle. In spite of the disturbing events, objects being moved and broken, the Malcolm family learned to accept the ghostly presence. But why is the Piper still haunting Duntroon? The reason is thought to do with the circumstances of his burial. As a MacDonald, the Piper was more than likely a Catholic, but the burial service was Episcopalian. The Malcolm family believes that the Piper's spirit was never truly laid to rest. A single standing stone marks the spot where the skeleton is said to have been buried. It is known as the Piper's Grave. But though he is nameless, his courageous act has immortalized him, the Piper of Duntroon. The lost soul the dogs seemed to notice. The haunting pipe music. Perhaps it is the piper returning to his post to pipe his lonely tune. Another Scottish castle has three fearsome hauntings. On the east side of Scotland, in the Grampian region north of Aberdeen, stands Fivey Castle. 
The great facade has been likened to a French chateau with its five impressive towers, each one a monument to the successive families who have owned the castle. Long before Fivey's oldest surviving tower was built around 1400, the land was a royal hunting forest. It was from here that King Robert the Bruce dispensed justice. But the castle's baronial exterior hides a ghostly history. Sometimes the very stones and mortar of a building become the focus of supernatural power. Inanimate objects retain influences from the past. This seems to be the case at Fivey Castle. Fivey is steeped in mystery and strange tales. It is a castle with a disturbed soul, blighted by three different hauntings. A hidden chamber which causes blindness or death to those who disturb it. A centuries-old evil curse laid upon the castle, still felt by those who work there. And the ghost of a betrayed wife, the Green Lady, who walks five his long corridors to this day. The castle's remarkable supernatural events are so evident that they have even convinced an unbeliever. The curator of arms and armour at Fivey is Major John Payton. One wet January afternoon as the Major entered Fivey's drawing room, he stepped aside to let somebody pass. But when he looked, no one was there. Only a strong rose perfume was left hanging in the air. Hello. What's Hello. been bothering you? The Major was urgently summoned to calm down a tourist who was in great distress. Looking in this mirror. The visitor described to the Major how she'd been looking around a bedroom when she saw something in the mirror that scared her half to death. Through a haze of shimmering green appeared the figure of a woman in a long, full dress ropes of pearls around her neck. Then in the blinking of an eye, she was gone. The visitor was in a terrible state. She thought no one would believe her, but the Major told her she was wrong. He believed her. Was I didn't doubt my mind, the Green Lady of Fivey. The Green Lady is thought to be the ghost of Dame Lilias Drummond. In the early 17th century, the owner of the castle was Alexander Seaton, Lord Fivey. He lived in the castle with his wife of many years, Dame Lilias. But Seaton was dissatisfied with her. He was a dominating personality and singularly ambitious. They had five daughters, but not a son, the heir he longed for. Relations of Dame Lilius lived nearby. Among the family was a young girl, Grizel. Seaton fell passionately in love with her. Suddenly, Dame Lilius was reported unwell. Within months, she was dead. Whispered rumors about how Lilius had died echoed around the castle. They focused on a tiny room at the top of one of the castle towers. Lord Seaton, they said, had locked his wife up in this room. Anyone who attempted to release her was thrown out of a nearby window. Alone and half mad, Lilius starved to death. Only weeks after his wife's suspicious death, Seaton married the young Grizel. Because of his powerful position within the Scottish hierarchy, Seton's actions were never questioned. Dame Lilius, however, would soon return to take her revenge on the new bride and groom. On their wedding night, Seton and his new wife heard the sound of heavy sighs from outside the window. 
Seaton tried to calm Grizel's fears by telling her that it was only the sighing of the wind. He opened the window and looked out, but the night was still and he could see nothing in the darkness. Seaton again assured his young bride that there was no need to worry. But as the night wore on, the sounds coming from the window grew louder and more human, like the cries of a woman in great despair. In the morning light, Grizel cautiously approached the window. She saw that something had been carved on the window ledge. In letters nearly three inches high and inscribed from the outside were the words, D. Lilius Drummond. They remain here to this day. Dame Lilius had returned from the spirit world to exact her vengeance. The Green Lady is a startling apparition, but though her appearance is distressing, she rarely causes harm. Another supernatural energy found within the castle is deadlier. At the center of its mystery is a hidden room and an ancient lethal curse. Twice in Fivey's history, the curse of the hidden room was invoked. The curse is quite specific. Death to the lord of the castle or blindness to his wife if anyone disturbs the chamber. In 1816, General William Gordon, the lord of Fivey, attempted to find the hidden room. The general failed to find easy access and very soon after his attempt, he died. From that time, his wife, a former domestic servant in the castle, was afflicted by a blindness with which she went to her grave. Already crowded with supernatural phenomena, Fivey House is yet another mystery. It is known as the Curse of the Weeping Stones. Its ominous presence hangs over the castle and can still be felt to this day. The tale of the curse is as old as the castle. More than 500 years ago, a prophet named Tamas the Rhymer was renowned for his gloomy predictions. He was ill-tempered and always quick to take offense. Thomas announced that he wished to visit Fivey Castle. In anticipation of his arrival and to welcome him, the castle's great doors were opened and were kept open at all times. But the years passed and Thomas had not come. Still the door stood open. Seven years and a day after he'd first announced his intention to visit the castle, Thomas arrived. But as he approached the entrance, a freak storm blew up. The door slammed in his face. Thomas viewed the incident as a personal insult, and in his anger, he laid a curse upon the castle and its lands. The curse spoke of three stones taken from the boundary markers of the castle lands. Until all three stones were found and reunited, a hex would remain on five years. Thomas's curse of the weeping stones decreed 
that the firstborn sons of the families that lived at Fivey would never inherit the castle. The curse is so powerful that the one weeping stone that has been recovered still exerts its evil influence. Christopher Hartley came under the stone's spell when he was working on its conservation and display. He soon had reason to wish he'd never set eyes on it. While we were working at the castle, I spent quite a lot of time with the weeping stone, um, examining it and preparing it for show to the public. And it was strange that every time I seemed to be closely working with it, shortly after, something terrible happened to me. The first time, having worked very closely with the stone, I twisted my ankle. And so did the surveyor, who had also seen it on the same occasion. The next time, I sprained my knee very badly. And the third time, when I put it into a showcase, I was rushed to hospital in the middle of the night with kidney stones. I didn't like to look at the stone anymore or go too close to it at all. I try to avoid it if I can. The Weeping Stone also has remarkable and unexplained physical properties. Although kept in dry conditions in a wooden bowl, the stone becomes wet and the bowl fills with moisture. Castle's eerie history is very much alive, and though today it's tourists, not courtiers, who throng the corridors, Fivey teems with spirits from the past. As Christopher Hartley says, the air here is very busy with more than human visitors. One great Scottish castle has a royal and haunting lineage. In the midst of the lush Angus landscape, at the centre of what was once a holy region, is Glam's castle. It is without doubt the most haunted castle in Scotland. Shakespeare chose Glam's as the setting for his tragedy in Macbeth. Here it is said, King Duncan was stabbed to death by Macbeth. Glam's hath murdered sleep, Macbeth shall sleep no more. But the real lords of Glam's, the Lion family, have a long and violent history as dramatic as any Shakespearean tragedy. Originally a hunting lodge of the King of the Scots, Glam's was given to the Lyon family in 1372 by King Robert II. The castle was the childhood home of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. In the calm light of day, this massive castle with its turrets, fortifications and spires exudes serenity, power, grandeur, even magic. But as night falls, the fairy tale image gives way to something more sinister. Glam's ghosts are numerous and legendary. Phantoms have been sighted in the castle for hundreds of years. And one Lord of Glam's is said to have been visited by the master of all evil. A strange atmosphere pervades the castle chapel, a feeling not threatening but of overwhelming sadness and the sound of a strange hollow knocking. The atmosphere gradually intensifies into an aura around an ethereal grey lady.
She kneels quietly at the altar, saying her prayers. Four hundred years ago, the close links between the Scottish royal family and Glam's castle had dreadful consequences. The sixth Lord Glam's had married the beautiful and accomplished Janet Douglas, and they had a son, John. The family lived peacefully at Glam's until the Lord died in 1528, leaving his wife in a very vulnerable position. Janet belonged to the Douglas clan. Her brother was stepfather to the king, James V, who despised his tyrannical stepfather. His loathing grew into an obsession, and he carried out a ruthless vendetta against the Douglases. The innocent Janet became the focus of the king's hatred. As a widow, Lady Glam's no longer enjoyed the protection of marriage, and King James seized Glam's for the crown. Lady Glam's was accused of magic and sorcery, of witchcraft, and mixing deadly potions with which to poison the king. No one doubted that these charges were completely false, but she and her son were arrested and taken to Edinburgh Castle, where they were imprisoned in its dark, fearsome dungeons. To procure testimony of her alleged treachery, the king had to resort to torture. Lady Glamsey's faithful servants and clansmen were stretched on the rack to extract false evidence against her. Her 16-year-old son, John, was forced to witness these horrors before he himself was brutally tortured. These savage tactics worked. The king had his confession. God! God! Janet was convicted of witchcraft, and she and her son were condemned to death. On the 17th of July, 1537, Lady Glam's was led out to her execution. Almost blind because of her long incarceration in a dark dungeon, she was brought onto the Castle Hill of Edinburgh, where she was burnt alive. The onlookers fell silent. An eyewitness account of the execution described her suffering with great commiseration, being in the prime of her years, of singular beauty, and suffering all, though a woman, with a manlike courage. Her innocence was never doubted. The account concluded that all men believed that the true cause of her execution was not witchcraft, but the hatred which the king carried for her brothers. Janet's son, John, was luckier. Although condemned to death, he was reprieved until he came of age. But before this happened, James V himself died. Before his death, the king is said to have felt remorse for his action. It was the black spot in his reign, for he was generally known as the poor man's king for his many good works. On the accession to the throne of his baby daughter, Mary, Queen of Scots, the title, lands and the ransacked castle of Glam's were restored to the young Lord John. From the time of Janet's execution, the apparition of the Grey Lady began to appear at the castle. Although she died in Edinburgh, it is here to her home that her spirit returns. The hollow hammering sound often heard in Glam's when she appears is believed to be the ghostly echo of workmen building the scaffold on which Lady Glam's was put to death. This is the case with another of Glam's disturbing manifestations. Unexplained sounds have been heard in the castle late at night. Men's voices are giving. The rattle of dice, 
and the spectre of an enormous man with a long flowing beard. Many of these hauntings have focused on the bedroom known as the Blue Room. One account recorded in the 1870s described the event. A guest at the castle, the wife of the Archbishop of York, was staying in the Blue Room. She awoke with the feeling that something had brushed her face, but she couldn't see anyone in the room. <coughs> Suddenly a figure loomed over her, a figure with a long flowing beard and the face of a dead man. At other times in the castle, late at night, the family has been disturbed by the sound of men's voices raised in anger, cursing, and the rattle of dice being thrown. In 1454, Patrick, the first Lord Larms, was said to have played host to an evil visitor at the castle. Lord Glams was known for his love of gambling and often played cards with Earl Beardy of Crawford, so called because of his long, thick beard. The pair were playing together late one Saturday night when a servant entered and reminded them of the hour. It was nearly the Sabbath and gambling was forbidden on the Lord's Day. But the men ignored him and played on. At five minutes to midnight, the servant again entered and pointed out the time. We care not what day of the week it is, Earl Beardy roared. If we have a mind to, we shall play until doomsday. He would regret his words. Still the men played on. Then on the stroke of midnight, the door opened. A mysterious stranger entered. He proposed to join them in a game. The stranger sat down and placed a stake of sparkling rubies on the table. The three men started to play. Lord Glams and Earl Beardy soon got into a heated argument. The stranger looked on. The sounds from the room became loud and furious and the servant longed to enter and see what was happening. But as he approached the door, he reeled back in terror. The two gambling men were enveloped in flames. That night, the castle knew it had entertained the Prince of Darkness, Lucifer. The two men were condemned by the devil to play until doomsday the price for gambling on the Sabbath. Blocking up the room did little to silence the noises. And could it be that the spectre of the bearded corpse was in fact the Earl, condemned as one of the living dead? In Scotland, the dark and rugged beauty of the landscape reminds us of the country's vivid history. Its warring ancient clans, hard fighting men, and their violent battles.
bloody revenge and cruel deeds that echo down the centuries. In the twilight world, between sleep and waking, spectres from another time move into our existence. To each of us they appear as something different. Sounds, smells, spirit forms. Across the waves, the warning notes from a loyal clansman play on forever. A name etched in stone. A tangible reminder of a betrayed wife from the spirit world. Rising through the smoke and flames, an innocent wronged soul returns home. Two men, prisoners in an endless game, are fated to play on until doomsday. Scotland is a land that has witnessed a bloody history of intrigue and betrayal. The victims of cruel torture and untimely death have become restless spirits, doomed to linger in its haunted castles. Cursing the generations that follow, their suffering echoes down the years. Deep in Wales' long memory is a history of violence and bloody curses, where the deeds of noblemen and warrior princes come back to haunt the living world. Acts of treachery and vengeance leave their stain within Wales' haunted castles. Wales is a land of ever-changing scenery. Stark, bare mountains give way to soft valleys that glisten under the rain. Water is everywhere in this rainy country. Wherever you are in Wales, you are never far from the sea. Over the centuries, many Welsh have lost their lives in the savage waters. Each breaking wave is said to be the spirit of some poor drowned soul come back to haunt the living. For the Welsh, water holds special meaning. A mysterious underworld exists beneath lakes and in damp underground tunnels across the country. Legends tell of bottomless pools where monstrous creatures live. They bewitch passing travellers, drawing them to their death. Fierce and powerful creatures dwell in this dark, wet world. The symbol of Wales is the red dragon, called Adraigur. These winged dragons are said to have the feathers of a peacock's tail with all the colours of the rainbow. Even in death, dragons are dangerous, as their venomous teeth can kill anyone who touches them. Wales has a turbulent history. Castles and great houses testify to lives of murder, betrayal, lust and vengeance. In the southwest of Wales, a haunted medieval fortress houses the persistent ghosts of a beautiful lovesick princess and an ugly vicious animal. 
Karoo Castle stands on a grassy mound above the tidal waters of the Karoo River. For more than nine centuries, it played an important part in Welsh history. Originally a military stronghold, it was modified over the years into an Elizabethan mansion. Now an elegant ruin, Karoo appears empty but eerie, inhuman cries are often heard at the castle. And the figure of a woman dressed in white continues to haunt Karu's dark corridors. The apparition of the lady in white was seen in the summer of 1996. A local scientist, Angela Ferguson, was researching the activities of a bat colony at the castle. As was her routine, the scientists settled down to spend a long night monitoring the movement of bats to and from their nests in the Great Hall. She had been working for several hours when she glimpsed a shape above her head. Through the half-light, she saw a white figure, a woman, walking silently towards a window high in the wall. It was as if the woman was floating in mid-air, gliding on a long vanished floor. The figure then vanished through solid stone. Although shaken by the apparition, the scientist noted everything she witnessed. When local people heard the scientist's account of the otherworldly visitor, they knew the identity of the ghost. She was the lady in white. In the year 1100, Wales was still mainly ruled by Welsh princes. But the Normans, having invaded and conquered England, had also settled into many parts of Wales. The young princess, Nest, was given in political marriage to an Anglo-Norman, Gerald of Windsor. Nest was a great prize, the daughter of a powerful Welsh prince. She was beautiful, charming and intelligent. Indeed, she is thought to have been the mistress of the English King Henry I and to have borne him a son. As part of her dowry, Nest brought her husband, Gerald, lands at Carew. The castle was built to be their new home. Nest was a dutiful wife, and during her marriage, she bore Gerald five children. But love intervened and changed her fate. In 1109, an event occurred that shocked all Wales. Nest had a cousin, Owain, the son of a prince. Having not met since childhood, the two were brought together at a banquet. Owain was captivated by her charm and beauty, and she likewise enjoyed her cousin's company. By the end of the night, the handsome, impulsive Owain determined to take her for his own. Late one night, Owain entered the castle with several companions. To cause a diversion, they set fire to another part of the castle and crept up to the room where Gerald and Nest lay sleeping. Gerald and Nest heard the commotion and feared it was an attempt to kill Gerald. Nest helped her husband to escape. When Owain entered the room, he found Nest alone and carried her away. The Welsh were scandalized by the fate of the abducted princess. They thought she had certainly been violently kidnapped and raped 
the country was thrown into turmoil. But history records the princess was a willing prisoner. During her two years with the young Owain, she bore him two children. Their initial attraction had turned to love. Gerald's honor had to be avenged. And in the bloody conflicts that followed, Owain's father was killed and the hot-headed Owain himself fled to Ireland. Nest was returned to her husband and family. Gerald's wife once more, Nest resumed her life at Carew. But Gerald was tormented, humiliated by Owain's deeds, troubled by his own cowardly escape from the castle. Gerald felt he was the object of ridicule. He bided his time until he could settle the score with Owain. This period of history saw many battles, and an uprising in South Wales in 1116 brought Gerald and Owain together as unlikely comrades in arms. It seemed as if the two men would put their past behind them, but Gerald's resentment soon caused blood to spill. Observing that Owain had gone out riding alone, Gerald seized the moment. He quietly summoned a group of his men and slipped out of the camp. Alone and off guard, Owain suspected nothing when he saw a guard approaching and stopped, making himself an easy target. He was shot dead with an arrow. Gerald, at long last, had his revenge. Nest outlived her husband, Gerald, and her children founded great dynasties. But Nest's true love was always her young cousin, the passionate Owain, who stole her away and shocked the kingdom. Local people believe she still looks out of a window at the castle, longing for her murdered lover. Is her love for Owain so strong that it has not faded after so many centuries? The lovelorn princess is not alone in haunting Cairn. Even more disturbing are a pair of ghostly appearances that plague the castle. Heavy, thudding footsteps have been heard. And at the windows, a horrible sight has been seen. The shadowy, frightening face of an unusual pet named Satan. Its blood-curdling cries and a shrill, piercing whistle often fill the castle. A 13-year-old girl visiting Keru one Sunday a few years ago will never forget the strange sight that awaited her. Her family had nearly completed their tour when they entered the ruins of a grand chamber. As her parents admired the view from the room, she wandered away from them. The girl felt herself drawn to the remains of an old fireplace. As she moved nearer, a monstrous image appeared. A monkey. <laughs> Lips pulled back in a snarl. Her parents could see nothing, but disturbed by their daughter's distress, they sensed something evil had been in the room. The apparition that the girl saw in this spot, oh, ape. Simon Hancock was an assistant here at the castle at the time the girl saw the monkey that so terrified her. I came into the castle one evening to lock up, like I'd done so many hundreds of times before and I stood at the bottom of these stairs, about to shout, we're locking up, and I heard a very large noise which rather startled me. 
and I realised that it was footsteps. There was an incredible feeling for three or four seconds as though somebody was standing in front of me. Simon didn't know what the footsteps were, but they may have been connected to the ghost of the monkey and a most ghoulish scene. In the early 1600s, the castle was leased to a one-time pirate of the high seas named Sir Roland Rees. Sir Roland was known for a hot temper, zealous religious views and foul language. He exploded in rage when his favourite son, Ewan, fell in love with the daughter of Sir Roland's tenant, a lowly Flemish merchant named Ludwig Horvitz. Ewan told his father that he would never give up his love. In a fury, Sir Roland told his son he never wanted to see his face again. Ewan took his father at his word and left Cairns. Sir Roland sunk into a black despair, raging with grief and anger. One moment he called out for his beloved boy, the next he cursed him to hell. Sir Roland often arranged banquets for his old captains and officers. The nights were filled with heavy drinking, but always there was a disturbing presence at the table, a monkey. Sir Roland brought the strange foreign creature back from one of his sea voyages. He named the monkey Satan, and it became his closest companion. At the banquet, Sir Roland cruelly mocked his guests, and the demonic monkey would mimic its master, screeching with cruel laughter. Soon no one came to the castle, knowing they would be the vicious entertainment at the strange dinner table. <sighs> On a bitterly cold night in March, Ludwig Horvitz, the tenant whose daughter had inadvertently caused the rift between Sir Roland and his son, came to the castle to pay his rent. He knew Sir Roland's feelings towards him, but worse, trade was bad that winter, and he had only part of the rent he owed. Horvitz was admitted to the castle and brought to Sir Roland. Sir Roland sat at the table, his monkey in a chair opposite. Horvitz explained that he had only half the rent. Sir Roland seized with anger. All the while, the monkey stared at the guest. Orvitz put down his wine, saying he would not drink where he was not welcome. Sir Roland cursed the visitor and his daughter for bewitching his son. Orvitz would not hear his daughter abused and raised his hand to the old man. For the insane Sir Roland, this was the final straw. He ordered his monkey to tear out Orvitz's eyes. Sir Roland blew on a silver whistle. With a shriek, the beast sprang at Horvitz, who fought the creature and finally threw it to the floor. Horvitz escaped from the room, leaving the wounded ape and the raving old man. Horvitz wanted to leave, but the night was so foul that a kindly servant, to make amends, insisted he stay. After a warm meal, their conversation was interrupted by the shrill sound of Sir Roland's whistle. Then came a dreadful cry of pain and struggle, and through it all a peal of wild, demonic laughter that died away to a long, terrifying scream. When they opened the door, they saw a sight that neither would forget to his dying day. Lying near the fireplace was Sir Roland, his throat gouged open. The creature's face lay in the flames, its eyes still glaring, its teeth fixed in a ghastly grin. Both master and ape were dead.
Are the footsteps heard in the tower those of Sir Roland, pacing the room in anger? Like the footsteps, the reason why the ape appeared to the young girl in broad daylight cannot be explained. What is known is that the monkey named Satan returns to its master's castle. Its demonic laughter and Sir Roland's piercing whistle haunt Carol's vast drafty rooms in an echo of those long ago violent days. Across the mountains of North Wales, in another castle, a terrible secret has come back to haunt modern-day visitors. In the Vale of Conway, beneath the Rock of the Falcon, sits Gwydir Castle. Originally home to one of the most significant families of North Wales, Gwydir is infamous for paranormal events and a wraith-like spectre centred on an area known as the Ghost Room. And the Swallow Falls near the castle are haunted by the face of a man crying out in agony. The name Gwydir is derived from the Welsh Gwydir, meaning field of blood, a reference to the horrific wars that took place here in the 7th century. Those battles are a distant memory, but so many mysteries are attached to the castle that the name is still appropriate today. Peter and Judy Welford bought the castle in 1994, intrigued by their new home's ghostly history. They asked a friend, an expert on the paranormal, to investigate Gwydir. Their friend, Gary, came to Gwydir with his equipment and explored the castle. He became very interested in the ghost room and the passage outside it. He set up his equipment there. When Gary checked his equipment later that evening, he knew a manifestation was imminent. The temperature suddenly dropped by 10 degrees centigrade. And the electrical capacitor short-circuited. Past experience told him an overwhelming paranormal force was present. It seemed as if Gary had unlocked Gwydia's ghosts for shortly after his experience in the ghost room, the castle erupted with supernatural energies. One afternoon, Peter and Judy's neighbours were walking through the castle. In the west wing, in the passage just outside the ghost room, they both saw something that stopped them dead in their tracks. Floating near the floor, directly in their path, was a pinkish purple ethereal, glowing mound. It seemed to move slightly in front of them. At the same time, the couple was overwhelmed by a foul odour coming from the nearby recess, a vile smell of decay, of rotting flesh. The substance Peter and Judy's neighbours witnessed is ectoplasm. A possible answer to these mysteries came when Peter and Judy opened the castle to visitors. A young couple on holiday were among a group of tourists. They wandered from room to room. Then the husband went on ahead of his wife. The visitor was a big, no-nonsense sort of man, not the kind of person one would imagine being susceptible to seeing a ghost. But he told a remarkable story. He was adamant that he had seen a man in old-fashioned clothes appear before him in the upper hall. The man had walked back and forth very confidently in front of the visitor. His presence had clearly been extremely disturbing. Fortunately, the visitor was able accurately to describe what he'd seen. The apparition wore a long cloak with an elaborate ruff at his neck, and he had a distinctive type of beard.
Peter remembered he had paintings of the previous owners of Gwydir waiting to be hung. He looked through them and found a portrait of a man from the Tudor period who exactly fitted the description of the ghost. It was Sir John Wynne, Gwydir's most famous and feared lord. In 1580, on the death of his father, the 26-year-old John Wynne had taken over as head of the family and returned to manage the Gwydir estate. An ambitious young man, Sir John was appointed a Member of Parliament and a Justice of the Peace. For his services he was knighted by King James I. Sir John presented the local town with houses for the poor and gave money to build a school. At Gwydir he proudly carved his blazon on the wall. But Sir John's ambition turned into a lust for power and wealth. On his estate and in the local towns, the people grew to despise him. In other words, he was a tyrant. However, Sir John's sins went much deeper. He had a long marriage and his wife, Lady Sidney, bore him 11 children. But like his benevolent public image, his role as a faithful husband was also a lie. Like many men of his position, Sir John wielded absolute power within his estate. If his amorous eye fell on one of his serving girls, they had little choice but to comply with his demands. Most girls succumbed and quietly slipped away when he tired of them. But for one serving girl, it ended in tragedy. The sordid secret was revealed when Sir John made a dreadful deathbed confession at the age of 73. Sir John revealed that many years before he tried to seduce a young girl. The seduction quickly became violent. During the struggle, the poor serving girl's head struck the wall. In the end, the girl was dead. Compounding the murder, Sir John admitted he hastily buried her in a recess in the wall. He ordered workmen to brick up the opening and seal the body in for good. Sir John died in 1626 and was grandly entombed in the local church. His deathbed confession was disbelieved by the few that had heard it and it remained a secret. But the people of the Conway Valley by now felt a great hatred towards that tyrant. For them, Sir John's spirit would never find peace, however elaborate his earthly resting place. People came to believe Sir John's tormented soul was trapped forever in the local waterfall called the Swallow Falls. There to be punished, purged, spouted upon and purified for the foul deeds done in his days of nature. Many saw Sir John's anguished face through the cascading torrent and threw rocks at his hated image as the crashing water mingled with his cries of pain. The castle owners, Peter and Judy, tried to uncover hard evidence about Sir John's murder confession. Then, during recent restoration work, they made a fascinating discovery. An inscription was found carved into a chimney it shows the letters I-W and a heart, and then the letter I. I-W stands for Johannes Wynne, that is, Sir John Wynne. But there is no clue to what the single letter I stands for. Peter discovered the chimney was altered by Sir John at some point in the 1590s, when it is recorded that he undertook major building works. Does Sir John's presence still remain at Gwydia Castle? Does the tyrant's legacy of evil connect his ghostly appearances, the terrifying emergence of ectoplasm, and the foul smell coming from the recess near the ghost room? What does the inscription mean? 
It is as if murderer and victim are locked together within the castle, one desperately drawing attention to her resting place, the other, the tyrant, still seeking to assert his power. Peter and Judy felt that although they couldn't control Gwydir's ghosts, they at least knew what they were dealing with. Then, not long afterwards, the couple made another chilling discovery. Peter was down in the cellar clearing away some recent flood water. As he shone his flashlight across the surface, he saw several small floating objects. When he examined them in the light, he saw that they were small bones. After clearing the cellar, he saw masses of bones sticking out of the clay. He collected about 200 in all, and then called the police. Then another altogether more friendly soul took up residence at the castle. Judy, how many dogs have you got? Well, we've got two dogs, two fawn-coloured lurchers. The story really began when a, a neighbour came over for dinner and saw three dogs playing together outside in the garden, and it was quite uncanny. And then the whole thing began to make sense when I actually saw the third dog, so-called the ghost dog, um, several times in the house. It was a solid dog. Eventually, the police gave Peter and Judy their forensic report. The bones, all 200 of them, were those of a large dog centuries old. The couple instinctively felt that their phantom hound must be the dog in question. They planned to rebury its bones in the cellar. But the police, thinking the bones of no further interest, had already incinerated them. Peter and Judy had grown fond of the ghostly dog and hoped to see it again. But since then, the playful dog, Gwydia's happy ghost, has not been seen. Gwydir Castle is busy with ghosts. The same is true at another castle, where a series of eerie events are based on one tragic story. The castle lies in the south of Wales, in the lush Vale of Glamorgan. St Donat's Castle dates from about the 14th century. The castle, well preserved and maintained, fascinates historians and visitors alike. Now home to the College of the Atlantic, St. Donuts is a center for students from all over the world. But the castle cannot ignore its ghostly heritage, as one student discovered. It was in November 1996. I'd been studying late in the castle. I shouldn't have been there, it was after lights out. I packed it in about two in the morning. I was coming through the inner courtyard, and as I came through the inner gatehouse, I looked towards the portcullis, and I saw a figure of a man standing. And I thought it was a member of staff, so I hid back behind into the inner gatehouse. So I looked again, couldn't see anything. So I carried on through into the portcullis, looking around me, couldn't see anyone. And just as I was leaving right out the other end, I heard footsteps behind me. And then turn around, and there wasn't anyone there. The only explanation I can think for it is that it might have been a ghost. The ghost that William saw was only one of the mysterious hauntings that have occurred here at St Donuts. To discover their identity, we must look back over a hundred years to the experience of one of the owners of the castle. In the 1860s, St Donuts was bought by Dr Nicol Kahn, the family set about restoring parts of the castle, but they could not settle happily. From the moment they moved in, disturbances began to happen. Day or night, the harpsichord in the drawing room suddenly began to play. The keys moved on their own, even when the keyboard lid was shut.
More upsetting was a repeated sighting in one of the castle bedrooms. Time and again, a bright light would appear in a corner of the room, waking the sleeping occupants. Then the light evolved into a terrifying image, a large, glaring eye. This unblinking eye filled the room until it slowly melted into the light. Then the light would suddenly extinguish. Dr. Kahn's family tried uneasily to live with the castle's supernatural events. But something happened that made them realise the unquiet spirits at St. Donetsk could not be easily brushed aside. One evening, as Dr. Kahn was on his way to bed, he saw a shape move in the corner of the room. As he walked forward to investigate, a deep, evil growl came from the blackness. To his amazement, he saw a pair of amber eyes. In fright, the doctor tried to retreat, but he was almost knocked over by a sudden blast of wind. He looked back to the amber eyes, but they had gone. Then he heard a rapping sound on the window. Looking out into the blustery night, he saw the outline of a woman. A shadowy hag stood in a long black cloak, beating against the window pane. She moved slowly away into the night. At her side was a black dog. Dr. Khan watched as they vanished into the air. These ghostly happenings were too much for Dr. Khan, and he was ready to sell St. Donald's, but in one last desperate attempt to banish the disturbing spirits, he invited a noted exorcist to visit the castle. When the exorcist arrived, he quietly surveyed the castle and chose the bedroom haunted by the glaring eye. He then requested that the doctor sit downstairs while the exorcism went on. The exorcist used no tools, holy water or herbs. He simply sat and prayed, calling the powers of darkness to come forth. The supernatural beings awakened and the spiritual battle began. Bright light filled the room and the disembodied penetrating eye appeared. The sound of music rang in the exorcist's ears. Downstairs, Dr. Khan felt the temperature drop. Then a blast of wind whistled down the stairs. As it passed, he saw for an instant the old hag. The exorcist, drained and exhausted, came downstairs. He could not be sure that the spirits had left the castle, but he was sure that the paranormal events were linked to the famous Stradling family that had lived at St. Donat's for many years. What had happened in the Stradling family centuries ago that had resulted in the terrible hauntings? For over 400 years, St. Donat's castle was the Stradling family home. They grew into a dynasty that was involved in the highest state affairs of Britain. With prosperous marriages, they fathered an unbroken line of male heirs to carry on the straddling name and power. Young Sir Thomas Stradling inherited the castle in 1735. Recently graduated from Oxford, he was known for a certain wildness. He loved parties and fun. During his ownership of the castle, the sound of laughter and music filled the air deep into the night. 
1738, Sir Thomas left St Donat's to go on a grand tour of Europe with a college friend, Sir John Tyrrit. The day before they set off, the friends made a pact. If one of them were to die, the survivor would inherit the other's estate. Thank you very much. Well, here's to us. Shortly afterwards, in the French town of Montpellier, in circumstances that were never fully explained, Sir Thomas met a mysterious and tragic end. Word from France hinted that the assailant was none other than Sir Thomas's best friend and travelling companion, Sir John Tibbet. It was said that Sir Thomas was deceived by his friend, manipulated into taking part in a duel. Sir Thomas, the last of the straddling family line, was shot through the eye and killed. Dueling was a brutal custom, common at the time, and the Stradling family considered it a heinous sin. The Stradlings supported King James I in putting an end to the practice. The family believed duelists went to the inner circle of hell to be eternally tormented. Just a few weeks after Sir Thomas's departure, several villagers witnessed a terrible apparition, one that all Welsh people dread. Moving in a swirl of wind towards the castle walls, they saw a hag with a vicious hound at her side. The hag, dressed in a long black coat, is an ancient Welsh legend. She is called Gurach Ribbin the ghost of death. When she and our hound appear, the Welsh know someone has died. The very next day, the castle knew the meaning of the Hag of Death's visit. Having waved goodbye to their young master only a few weeks before, all at St Donat's were in deep mourning as they awaited the return of his body. His corpse was laid out in the drawing room. Candles around Sir Thomas's coffin were lit and the servants withdrew. Sir Thomas's corpse lay peacefully, but not for long. A gust of wind blew open a window and one of the funeral drapes caught fire. Soon the whole coffin was ablaze and as the flames licked upwards, the portraits of all the straddling ancestors glowed bright red before burning to a cinder. Sir Thomas's young body was never given a proper funeral. Never again would a straddling inhabit St Donat's. The young Sir Thomas had brought tragedy to the family and after the fire, his body was never laid honourably to rest. For the next century, there was no resident lord. The castle was neglected and gradually became partly ruined. It was at this time that St Donat's began to be haunted. Ghostly music filled the empty rooms, the echo of Sir Thomas's happy times at the castle. An apparition connected to his death, the glaring luminous eye appeared in the room that was his bedroom, a constant reminder of his horrific wound. And the legendary Welsh hag who was seen at the time of his death appeared again at St Thomas. The effect of Sir Thomas's death must have been so powerful that these spirits clung to the castle. But despite its ghostly reputation, the beauty of St Donat's always attracted attention. In 1925, American newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst bought the castle. St Donat's benefited from Hearst's huge wealth. Repairs and alterations were carried out, and the rooms were filled with fine antiques. No more word of ghosts was heard. Until 1996 when the ghost of a man was seen within the castle walls. Was it Sir Thomas Stradling returning once more to his ancestral home? Mm. 
Omens of misfortune are not unusual in Wales. In valley or mountain, ancient beliefs still exist. And at the center of these beliefs are castles, each hiding its secrets. But sometimes, for a moment, they are revealed to us. A beautiful princess still searches for love in the living world. Violent memories stay trapped within the crumbling stones. Supernatural substances terrify the living. As we've seen, ghosts come in many disguises. Sometimes even the ghost of a living person can be seen, whether it's across the other side of the world or much nearer to home. Immersed in Ireland's timeless beauty is a dark history of magic, ritual and primeval worship. Elemental forces from this ancient past come back as apparitions to wander amongst the living. And many of these restless souls are trapped in Ireland's castles. The spirits reach out from the beyond, lost phantoms that have become the castle ghosts of Ireland. Ireland is a land so rich in history and mythology. It is difficult to know where one begins and the other ends. Among the sacred spots, burial mounds and bewitched trees of Ireland. The spirit other world of the dead is as real as that of the living. Ireland is crowded with supernatural inhabitants, creatures like fairies. But here, fairies are not cartoon-like creatures with wings and magic wands. According to folklore, they can assume human characteristics and live side by side with mortals. If disturbed, fairies can be sinister and dangerous, exacting vicious revenge on humans. It is very bad luck to build on ground belonging to the fairies. Across Ireland, places known as fairy forts are left untouched by humans. These fairy dwellings often take the form of a ring of trees or a circle of stones. To build upon the forbidden sites would anger the fairies and result in misfortune and even death. Myth has it that angered fairies shoot poison darts at cattle and horses. They can transport men and women away from their loved ones into a dark fairy land. And most disturbing of all, they carry off human children substituting changelings in their place. In Ireland, spirits and ghosts slip in and out of the living world, some to do good, others to do harm. And it is in Ireland's haunted castles that many of these ancient souls still dwell. In County Carlow on Ireland's east coast, in the village of Clonegall, stands Huntington Castle.
This historic castle is the home of disturbing apparitions from another world and another time. The castle was originally built in the 14th century as the stronghold of the Cavanas, an old Irish clan. Since that time, there have been many changes of ownership and the castle has been rebuilt and added to by each successive owner. At one time, an abbey stood here. Religion has always had a special place at Huntington. But something even older dwells at Huntington a primeval psychic force from Ireland's deepest history. So powerful it radiates beyond the castle walls. In this field, a man who knows Huntington well has been a witness to unusual sightings. He says that he's repeatedly seen a group of men and women in the field, in long clothes, that they've been moving away across the field and that they've suddenly vanished. And here in an area of wilderness called the Yew Walk, many people have seen unexplained figures moving among the trees. Huntington Castle has been owned by the Durden Robertson family since the 18th century. The current owner is David Durden Robertson. The most um, odd experience I had was when I was about 17. I'd gone to sleep on the couch in the library. When I woke up, the room was quite bright and the whole I was almost sort of spinning around. I became aware at that stage that there were two faces peering down at me. His body was lifted up until he was actually floating above the couch. Well, it was a most extraordinary experience. They hadn't touched me, but they just looked down at me. It was as if I was in their power. The native inhabitants of Ireland were the Celts, and 1,500 years ago, a special priestly class of learned men lived among them. These people professed to have magic powers and a secret knowledge of the world. They were the Druids. As the keepers of religion, Druid leaders often rivaled Celtic kings and chiefs in prestige, even in power. The Druids have a special place in Irish mythology. For apart from their great learning, their extraordinary powers enabled them to act as intermediaries between gods and mortals. They were believed to be able, at a stroke, to create a mist start fires at will, or bring down showers of blood. The Druids were held in awe for their wisdom, but they were also feared. Animals were regularly used in sacrifices, but to commune with the gods, Druids needed the most valuable and potent blood offering of all. Human sacrifice. The Druids picked fine young men and women who were ritually sacrificed as mates for the gods. There were many methods of sacrifice. The chosen victims were burned in huge wicker structures, impaled on stakes, drowned, or buried alive. Because of their reverence for the natural world, a favorite form of sacrifice was to slit the victims' throats and let their blood flow into the earth. In 
Is it possible the figures David saw looming over him were the ghosts of ancient druids? Had they returned in search of a victim? Huntington Castle is in some way connected with these spirits of an earlier, darker time. Indeed, this mysterious, sacred well in the core of the castle is called the Druid Well. It remains the castle's spiritual centre and may be the source of Druid visits into our modern world. The bloody events of over 1,500 years ago are still imprinted here centers of energy held in the atmosphere of Huntington's ancient walls. And perhaps the Druids will return here again from the beyond, hunting for victims to sacrifice to their pagan gods. Some ghosts are a mystery that can never be solved. Why do they appear in certain places and at certain times? But other ghosts have a special attachment to a particular place and return to it again and again. This is the case at our next castle, where a ghost came back from the world of the dead to help its living descendants. The ghost appeared quite recently at Castle Leslie, which lies in County Monaghan, near the border between Southern and Northern Ireland. The castle has been the home of the Leslie family for over 300 years. In January 1996, Castle Leslie was invaded by paranormal activity and a series of identical sightings of an unexpected guest. On a number of occasions, the uh, bells in the servants' hall would start ringing and I knew there was nobody else in the house. Another time I was in the hall behind the kitchen and I was looking for something in the deep freeze and I saw a grey figure walk past behind me. Elton? Elton? Sammy assumed it was Elton, her partner, and called out to him. He didn't answer. Elton! She then realised that it couldn't have been Elton. He was out of the castle at the time. And then, over the next few months, supernatural activity fairly erupted at Leslie. Sammy was alone, cooking in the castle kitchen, when from behind her she heard a strange noise. A shower of orange pits hit the wall beside her, and there was no one else in the room. That was frightening enough, but then another thing happened. Again, Sammy was working in the kitchen when quite suddenly the electric food mixer burst into life. And it wasn't even plugged in. Three separate sets of guests at the castle described a ghostly ordeal in the bedroom known as the Red Room. None of the guests had stayed at Leslie before and had no knowledge of the castle's history, but they all recounted almost identical experiences. The first guest couple reported being woken in the middle of the night by a light in the room. They described a soft daylight. Then through the light they saw a man standing over the chest of drawers. It appeared he was looking for something. Then the image and the light faded away. A few weeks later, another couple stayed at the castle. They described exactly the same thing as the previous couple. But this time the guests experienced something more frightening. The figure moved over to the end of their bed. Facing the couple, he put his finger to his lips and softly whispered, Shh. 
then disappeared. Just a few weeks after the second sighting, a man in the pale light returned to Castle Leslie for a third time. Once again, two guests staying in the red bedroom were woken by the strange light. Terrified, they saw the figure in the corner of the room by the chest. But this time the man walked to the bed, held up a scroll of papers and smiled. Transfixed by the apparition, the couple saw that across his forehead was a bloody wound. Who was this ghost and why did he keep appearing at the castle? A reason may be found in Ireland's recent history. At the outbreak of World War I in 1914, Ireland's soldiers and reservists were immediately mobilised. By the end of the war, more than 200,000 Irishmen had served not only Ireland, but Great Britain. And many had given their lives. In 1914, Sammy's great-uncle, Norman Leslie, was in his mid-twenties. Like so many men at the time, he volunteered to fight in the Great War. Norman was the son of Lady Leonie Leslie. Leonie and Norman were devoted to each other, so it was with great reluctance but a sense of duty that she saw her son leave the castle to fight with the Rifle Brigade in France. Weeks passed. The exact whereabouts of his regiment were secret, but Leonie wrote her son many letters, sending him news of home and looking forward to his safe return. Then on the morning of October the 18th, 1914, word came up to the castle. Young Master Norman had been seen standing on the far side of the lake. The gamekeeper who saw him ran to the castle to bring Lady Leonie the good news. Another estate worker sent word that he too had spotted Norman in the grounds. Overjoyed, Leonie flew into action. Norman's room was hurriedly prepared and the servants made the castle ready to welcome the soldier home. But an hour passed, and then another, and still Norman did not come. He never came. A week later, a telegram arrived. Norman had been killed in action at Almontiere, France. The date of his death was the 18th of October, 1914, the very day he'd been seen standing by the castle lake. The exact whereabouts of Norman's body was unknown, but his family was determined to find it and give him a proper burial. Two months later, Norman's brother Shane traveled to the French battlefield where Norman had been killed. Shane was guided to the spot near a railway embankment where a fellow soldier had written that Norman's body had been left, buried in a shallow grave, wrapped in sacking. Shane looked down on the body of what he thought was his brother. To make sure that it was Norman, he put his hand inside the gaping jaw and felt for the broken tooth that would identify the young soldier. The remains were indeed Norman's. The painful task was completed when Norman's body was buried at a church nearby.
The appearance of Norman by the lake is a form of apparition seen at times of crisis, such as war, when thousands can die in a single day. It is one of the most widely reported types of ghost. It is as if at the very moment of crisis or death, while the spirit is not yet released from earthly bonds, a telepathic connection creates a spontaneous image of the individual. This ghostly image can appear before a loved one or in a place to which in life they were especially attached. I think Norman's spirit feels a very strong bond with his home and a very deep love for his family. And I think it was very important when he died that he came back to say his goodbyes. But that isn't quite the end of the story, is it? Norman's been back again, hasn't he? He has. Sammy believes it was Norman in the servants' hall trying to attract her attention with the bells. And in the kitchen, throwing the orange pits and starting the appliance. Of course, the red room was Norman's bedroom. Who else could the ghost have been? And the papers Norman's ghost held up? Sammy felt that the apparitions and poltergeist occurrences were Norman's way of trying to get a message to her. For many years, the Leslie family had been in conflict over the inheritance of the estate. Sammy had searched for an important document which she hoped would solve their problems. After Norman's ghost was sighted holding the scroll of papers, Sammy was prompted to search for the documents again in the castle vaults. When she touched a certain file, a shudder went up her spine. It contained the very papers the family needed. If Norman's ghost had not appeared, the file would have remained undiscovered and Sammy's claim to Castle Leslie would have been in jeopardy. The future of the castle is now secure because of Norman's appearance. Ghosts manifest themselves in many different ways. Some are figures as solid as a living person. Others bear little resemblance to the human form. Poltergeist hauntings, such as those at Castle Leslie, can be the most disturbing ghost experience. Inanimate objects suddenly erupt in violent motion to disrupt the peaceful routine of the living. Just such a terrifying poltergeist appeared in County Limerick on Ireland's west coast and took hold of Glyn Castle. Situated on the banks of the River Shannon, Glyn Castle dates from the 14th century and is home to the Knight of Glyn. The present castle is a Georgian Gothic fantasy built by the 24th Knight in 1789. Today, the castle remains in the Fitzgerald family and is a delightful home. But it was here on a night in 1991 that two of the castle's loyal workers were subjected to a traumatic ordeal. Things started off normally. The knight had had a guest for dinner and May and Nancy cleared away as usual. It was close to midnight by the time they went up to bed. May went straight to sleep and Nancy read for a while before turning off the light. I was only just settled down about 12 o'clock when I heard this noise on the stairs as if somebody was coming up, labouring in terrible trouble, like as if they were trying to do the stairs and not able. Nancy called out to another employee of the castle, Una, who slept in the next bedroom. Una. Una. Una called back that she was in bed and had also heard the banging. No. 
Nancy finally crossed the landing in the dark and put her hand to the light switch. As soon as she pressed it, everything went quiet. I would never again in my whole life want the same experience. It was terrible. It was desperate. May and Nancy had spent their working lives in the castle, but they had no idea who or what the poltergeist was. Perhaps another haunting at the castle holds the explanation. Sometime later, the knight of Glynn himself discovered a clue. He learnt that earlier on the day that the poltergeist struck, a group of visitors had been touring the castle. Amongst the visitors had been a psychic medium. Although the medium entered the castle purely as a visitor, could her presence have unwittingly unlocked the violent energy of this most unhappy ghost? The answer to Glyn Castle's poltergeist activity may lie in a ghostly experience the knight had as a child. A frayed rope hung in midair. The eerie sight filled the young boy with dread. But when he returned to the hall to show the mysterious rope to his mother, it had disappeared. Perhaps the events of nearly a hundred years before had some bearing on the strange rope apparition the young knight beheld. In 1867, the castle was undergoing decoration. A Dublin firm was employed to carry out the work, which included painting the ceiling under the hall staircase. The builders used planks of wood and heavy rope to form a scaffold. A tragedy struck. Without warning, one of the ropes supporting the planks of wood gave way. The builder painting the ceiling was unable to save himself. He died. Was the rope that the young knight saw all those years later the one that had broken and caused the accident? Perhaps the trauma of that long ago event was still locked into the castle's atmosphere and it took the sensitivity of a young boy momentarily to connect with the anguish of the long forgotten tragedy. It was a long time ago, but um, I can picture that rope hanging there really as if it was yesterday. Could the haunting that May and Nancy experienced so recently also be connected with that tragic event. Ghosts of inanimate objects like Glynn's rope are not unique. The strength and intensity of the image may in part be due to the degree of psychic receptiveness of the person present, who seems momentarily to release the ghostly energy. Ah! 
For many Irish families, the approach of death is thought to be foretold by the cry of an otherworld woman, the Banshee. The Banshee's wailing has the tone of a real woman's voice, and her cry is heard near the home of those about to die. If this cry is heard three nights in a row, that person will certainly die. The Banshee is more often heard than seen, although some people claim to have glimpsed an old woman who combs her long white hair as she laments. In whatever form ghosts manifest themselves, none is more terrifying than what is called the elemental. This type of spirit is said to exist near Burr in County Offaly, where it inhabits Lepp Castle. The elemental is a frightening phantasm from the beyond that envelops those who experience it in its malignant force. The ghost is so horrifying, its hauntings bring an overwhelming sense of evil and deep-rooted fear. And in one remarkable recorded instance, a witness had an intimate experience with this horrifying apparition. She felt the touch of the appalling thing, known at Lep as It. Built in the 14th century, Lep is said to be the most haunted castle in Ireland. As if the very stones were rejecting human habitation, the castle lay in ruins for years. Tall and lonely, the fortress had a ghostly reputation so strong that local people avoided it at night. Completely gutted by fire, Lep was boarded up, its gates padlocked for over 70 years. But from across the fields, late at night, locals would describe seeing the windows at the top of the castle light up for a few seconds as if many candles had been brought into the room. When the elemental haunts the castle, the temperature suddenly falls. There is a suffocating, sickly sweet odour and an overwhelming sense of dread. The vile elemental, it, seems to have been born out of the long and turbulent history of Lep, and this room has been a witness to its ruthless past. It is known as the Bloody Chapel, after a shocking murder that was done on this very spot over 400 years ago. On the death of the chieftain Mulrooney of Cal, in 1532, a fierce rivalry for the leadership erupted among the family. Brother opposed brother in a bitter contest for power. One brother was a priest, his opponent another brother named Taig. One night in the castle chapel, the O'Carroll priest was saying mass for a group of his family. As he was chanting the holy rites, the door of the chapel opened and his rival brother Tig burst in. Tig lunged forward with his sword, fatally wounding his brother. The butchered priest fell across the altar and died. The heinous act of brother killing brother and the blasphemy of a sacred mass cut short by evil sent an echo of misery ringing round the walls of Lep Castle. But another source of evil was found here at Lep. It is called an oubliette, a name used to describe a hidden dungeon. It means a little place of forgetting. And those who were forgotten within these walls suffered unimaginable misery and pain until death. Lep 
Lep's oubliette is a little room with a drop floor off the bloody chapel. Prisoners from clan wars or family enemies would be pushed into the room to fall through the floor and land on a spike eight feet below. Prisoners not lucky enough to die quickly on the spike faced gradual starvation in a doorless room while the sound of merriment and the aroma of food drifted up from the rooms below. A narrow window let the prisoners watch those who came and went in freedom at the castle. At the turn of the last century, workers were given the task of clearing the oubliette. They made a hideous discovery. Human skeletons lay piled on top of each other. Three cartloads of bones were removed. It was shortly after the gruesome discovery within Lep's oubliette that a psychic disturbance caused the elemental it to emerge. In 1659, the ownership of Lep Castle passed in marriage from the O'Carroll family to an English family, the Darbys. In the possession of the Darbys, Lep became a family home. It was improved and extended, the gardens landscaped, and a full staff employed to maintain it. By the late 19th century, descendants Jonathan and Mildred Darby looked forward to bringing their family up at Lep. As was the fashion of the day, Mildred Darby was interested in the occult. Little did she know that her innocent dabbling would bring her face to face with it. Because of its bloody associations, Lep had always had a reputation for being haunted. Shall we begin? Nevertheless, Mildred naively toyed with magic. As if sensing a call from the daylight world, the dormant elemental awakened with ferocity. In 1908, Mildred wrote an article for the journal The Occult Review, describing her ordeal at the hands of the terrifying manifestation that infested Lep. I was standing in the gallery, looking down to the main hall, when I felt somebody put a hand on my shoulder. The thing was about the size of a sheep. Thin, gaunt, and shadowy in parts. It, its face was human, or to be more accurate, inhuman in its vileness. Its lusterless eyes, which seemed half decomposed in black cavities, stared into mine. The horrible smell, which had before offended my nostrils only a hundred times more intensified, came up into my face, filling me with a deadly nausea. It was the smell of a decomposing corpse. Why did this elemental inhabit Lep? Could it have been the combined horrors of the bloody O'Carroll murder? And all those lost, dead souls walled up in the oubliette, drifting in despair to death? Whatever it may have been, after Mrs. Darby's experiments with the black arts, the castle was never the same again. Hauntings plagued Lep, leaving a sinister air throughout the castle. The Darbys stubbornly remained at Lep, but in 1922 the castle suffered another misfortune when, as the home of an English family, it became the target of the Irish struggle for independence. The castle was destroyed by bombs and completely looted. Nothing but a burned-out shell remained. The Darbys were driven out. Eventually, in the 1970s, Lep was bought by an Australian who had links with the area. 
At this time, a mystic, a white witch from Mexico, was brought in to exorcise the castle. After spending many hours in the bloody chapel, the mystic explained that the spirits at Lep were no longer malevolent, but they wished to remain there. Six years ago, Sean Ryan and his wife Anne bought the castle, a complete ruin. When they arrived, the family is making it habitable again. In the meantime, they live in the castle gatehouse with their young daughter. Well, shortly after we arrived here, Sean began working on the building. He had an unfortunate accident and he broke his kneecap, which actually had to be removed, and it set us back about a year with the work. When the kneecap repaired, he started to work again. He had another accident and broke his ankle. And we began to think that we weren't really wanted here, there was something going on. But um, we've overcome that now and we're back restoring the building again. So we're, we're happy to share the place with whatever spirits are here. In 1991, Lepp's walls echoed to an unfamiliar sound, laughter. Friends and family gathered in the chapel to witness the christening of Sean and Anne's young daughter, Kira. Strewn with flowers and lit by candles, the chapel was filled with smiling faces. We had a marvellous day, all our friends in great atmosphere, so we think we've laid to rest anything that might have happened previously. After the ceremony, every guest noted how even though there was a strong wind blowing in from the fields through the open windows, the candles barely flickered and not one blew out. If Lep's troubled spirits are unwilling to leave, let us hope that at least they have found peace. In this land where so much is attributed to myth and legend, the castle ghosts we have encountered remind us that not all mysterious events belong in storybooks. For the people who come face to face with ghosts, the images are a real and often shocking reminder of a world beyond our own. In Ireland's castles, it is as if spirits from thousands of years ago reach out to touch us. The sorcery of an ancient people casts a spell over the living. Spontaneous manifestations assault the senses with their intensity. The anguish of violent death leaves a grim influence. Can the tormented spirits of the past ever be laid to rest? <laughs>